a little trick, clean the lens, and you've instantly got a clearer picture. Oh, and, right. Well, when I saw the bit of the uh, COVID weeping, dropping everyone into break out here. Hi and welcome. I'm Yola and this is the B Video Confidence Show, uh, the very first one and uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, in this series of shows we're going to be talking with businesses, charities and business owners about the impact of COVID-19 and online communications. Uh, impact on the businesses, good and bad, and their plans on how to use online video communications or not use it in 2022 and I'm delighted today I've got Bronwyn, um, Bronwyn from Brogue Opera um, who I actually network with her so uh, since 2019 I see her on a daily basis and um, we have both been on the WhatsApp channel um, weeping some days mm -hmm. with frustration, weeping with joy some days and uh, always, always impressed by her resilience, um, being just so tough and getting through the COVID. And in fact, during that first year of lockdown, Bron was re leading the chapter, the BNI chapter that I'm in. And um, I just couldn't believe it. You know, every morning, every Thursday morning, there she was with a huge smile on her face. And um, some of us were just despairing and she just encourage us all to keep going and uh, and thrive. So with that short introduction, uh, could, it could be a lot longer, um, I'd like just a little bit of her bio. I've got it here. And um, in 2018, Bronwyn founded Rogue Opera with a vision of bringing opera to new audiences and unconventional spaces. Uh, Bronwyn, is, she's an opera singer, stage director, and a small business owner originally from Adelaide, Australia, but now firmly, firmly settled in the UK. Uh, from when she provides creative work for her artists and road op opera troupe and introduces new audiences to opera, as well as singing the title role in Rogue Opera's inaugural season of Bizet's Carmen, absolutely fantastic that was just amazing. Bronwyn directed the production and saw it performed in a variety of venues. Working with this dedicated troupe, um, Bronwyn sees her concerts come to life, and that really has been a high point of musical career. Um, just seeing that vision really come to life, and and people really just blown away by it. Ah, uh, challenges presented by COVID nineteen in twenty twenty, they took Bronwyn and Rogue Opera into new ventures, broadcasting over forty five live stream performances and building a platform an online platform with over a hundred video performances so where are we now back on tour for gala performances Bronwyn's created written and directed the English libretto production a modern opera love story for Fuller's opera in the garden well welcome Bronwyn Thank you, Yola. What a what an introduction. That's uh, really nice to see the last sort of two years summed up like that for me. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Well, that's where we're going to start. We're going to start with um, that week in 2020 when everything just shut shut down. Now, mm -hmm. um, as a performer, your industry was really really impacted by this. So, can you just take us back to this kind of first few months um, and, and how your business was faring? Sure. I mean, it's, it seems very surreal, actually, to think back that far, because in some ways it seems so long ago. And then you say 2020, actually, that was only last year. And, you know, I'm sure lots of people share that thought that actually we've all been through so much and so many ups and downs and so many phases of this pandemic that, yeah, it's, it's interesting to go back to the beginning. So, so at the beginning, I think, around March, there was, you know, rumours that there were things happening and, you know, people were sort of watching. And I actually went on holiday around that time. I, I met a friend in Barbados, of all places, um, every couple of years. I'm very lucky to be able to meet my best friend in a nice, warm, sunny spot. And we were trying to just enjoy ourselves being on holiday, not look at the news too much. But obviously, it was really 
over that week when I was on holiday when things really started to sort of get serious. Um, and so while trying to enjoy the holiday, while trying not to freak out, while everyone else was sort of like, oh, should we get flights home? I also started to have cancellations come in already for work. So I'd sort of taken that opportunity to go on holiday just before what was meant to be a very busy um, year of work. And, you know, it was almost week by week, then day by day, pretty much everything was being postponed and then outright cancelled. And all of a sudden I was facing a year that was, you know, going to be, what was that, 2020 was sort of the third real year. 1920. Yeah, the third real year of Rogue Opera where we'd done a lot of the groundwork, we'd done a lot of the brand building, we had two successful productions under our belt, we were getting some great repeat business with corporates and private events, um, some great ties with community workshops, all that kind of thing. And just to see that suddenly disappear is heartbreaking and, you know, would have been for everyone. But I think at that sort of new business stage of really thinking, okay, this is the point where we were starting to take off and, and suddenly just not know what was going to come next was really um, terrifying, to be honest. And the extra um, thing on top of all that was that, you know, being a small company, working in the performing arts, all of the projects we do, I employ all these fantastic singers and pianists and instrumentalists and stage directors and movement directors. You know, I work with people on a project by project basis and, and everyone pretty much in that industry, unless you're working for the big top five houses, are uh, freelance. And so I was also watching, you know, the whole industry suffering, all these freelancers suddenly very unsure of any support they were going to get. I couldn't furlough anyone in my company because I didn't have a full-time employees. And so there was that that added stress on top of things as well. Uh, and so I think all of that stress and panic and, and just seeing really nothing that we could do about it um, led me to think, well, one thing I can do that I've never done before, what you could see lots of people doing was still to try and stay present somehow and go online and live stream. And so I think it took me about three and a half weeks from that sort of making that decision, doing a big technology learning curve. <laughs> and then by Easter Friday of 2020, um, I did my first live stream show for my lounge room slash rogue opera studio. And that actually set the format for what we did for the next sort of, you know, 12 months. And it was terrifying, I have to say, because, you know, as I said, I went on this huge technology learning curve. Um, the first uh, outlet was Facebook because that seemed to be the easiest thing to do, but easy was certainly not, you know, anywhere in the scale of it. Um, but I had to learn about microphones. I had to learn about streaming platforms. I had to, um, you know, be familiar being in front of a camera because at that point it was a complete lockdown couldn't have anyone else in the studio with me so I was working with our music director Guy Murgatroyd and um, to create piano backing tracks so that I could sing with him not virtually uh, live because of all the streaming and uh, you know um, syncing issues that come with that so yeah it was just a whole lot of, of new things and it continued to be a whole lot of new things but um, I think you know you said when we're preparing for this any tips that in on reflection, even though it was very terrifying, I think the fact that I just went ahead and did it and then just kept doing it was really the best way to learn because there was no template for it. You know, no one had been through this before. And um, as stressful as it was, I think actually just getting up every week in front of this camera, making mistakes, correcting those mistakes, moving up to another level, um, you know, was, was the only way to do it. If I'd sat back and, and thought about it for too long, I would never have done it. <laughs> Well, I do remember when you contacted me and said, you know, could I help you with the audio? I, I just completely freaked out. I just was way beyond my wildest dreams. I could even even begin to help with that. Mm. Um, so, I, you know, I think we've all come such a long way. Um, mm. But I seem to remember when you started this off, nobody else was doing this. Or, or am, I, am I wrong? You know, did you have any role models to look at? Uh, not really. I mean, I think people, you know, live streaming on Facebook had been a bit of a thing, I think, but certainly not. Um, I didn't have any peers that were doing it. I think it took the Royal Opera House another six months <laughs> before they did any kind of live stream, um, which, you know, sorry, Royal Opera House, but I do like to, to float that around, you know, and obviously they're a huge organisation. They've probably got lots of checks and balances to go through. And, and you know, when they did do it, it was a, it was a huge production and a, and a huge, you know, success. But, yeah, there wasn't really anyone else doing that. And, and I think what I've learned over the last year and a half or wherever we are now, 18 months, um, coming up to two years, 
uh, you know, how much respect I have for anybody who works in sound and, and visuals and TV. And, you know, that hadn't been my world at all. My world has always been live performance. And I've only really just scratched the surface, but I tried to learn as much as I could. I got advice for some really generous technicians who did Zoom calls with me and helped me set up my microphones, um, helped me with some basic EQing and, and, you know, different things you had to think about for live performance. Um, and it's very, very difficult to recreate a live performance through through any kind of medium, even if you have like the best live TV studio and the best cameras and the best microphones, you need so much expertise to be able to convey the magic of that sound and the visual performance through any kind of camera, um, through, you know, whether it's a computer screen or a TV screen. Uh, so I think, you know, in some ways, these sort of big pandemics and big events always, you know, make a step change in accessibility for that. So what we have now is a world where previously that kind of thing would only ever been dreamt of if you were the Royal Opera House and you had a huge production team and all that technology and expertise. Whereas now I'm able to do it. Um, people like you are able to do podcasts. Um, there's, you know, so much innovation that's gone on. And, uh, you know, I think, of course, there's the place for that top end production styles. But what I've learned is that, you know, with some knowledge and some investment, and it does take investment in technology and, and understanding that you can find ways to connect with people through this medium, live streaming and video that we, you know, I would never have had in my business plan previous to COVID. Well, that's absolutely true because I remember the summer and um, a particular photo went round um, Facebook and it was um, somebody who'd bought a ticket to your performance. Mm. They were in their living room with a, a big video screen on the wall mm. with the windows open, sun shining in and playing opera in the house mm. and isolated, you know, locked mm. down. But this outside world was just pouring in um, into their, their their living space, mm. and uh, and that was really really quite very exciting. And and as you're right, before anyone else was doing it. Mm. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and it was though you know looking back now on those kind of um, moments, you know, when I was right in the middle of it, they were very appreciated when people would send me those kind of images or send me a message, and we ended up setting up a, a membership subscription platform and, and we continued live streaming every week and we sort of made it much more formal and, and was able to get other singers involved. Um, but there were a few people who'd been with me right from the beginning from Facebook who were, you know, continued to be fans right up until the time we stopped doing the live streaming, which was May this year. Um, and, you know, just those messages I would get from people uh, saying thank you so much for doing this every week. You know, it is, it's a window into the opera world for a lot of people and, and what I yeah. did with the live streams that it wasn't just a performance um, and it's what I sort of like to do with Rogue Opera in any case, you know, with this idea of bringing it out to audiences in a different way is we'd, um, you know, because we couldn't, there was no way we could put on a whole scene or a whole opera, but what we could do is present little um, vignettes of arias and ensembles and to make that accessible to as many people as possible, um, I would introduce it, the singers performing would introduce it, my music director Guy would, would give us some amazing insights into, you know, the musicality of the piece we're about to hear and the feedback I got over and over again from people was that they loved the performance itself, but they also loved that behind the scenes sort of insight into the character or yeah. the music or the composer. And, you know, again, that's something that I think I had as an intention, you know, when I'm developing a program and if I'm doing a, a now we're on tour doing sort of opera galas and we keep that format, but really being able to focus it and each week we have a theme and we could really think about, you know, what are we going to focus on this week? Which four pieces of music are we going to focus on? Which themes are we going to focus on? And, you know, that's that was a real gift to, to be able to put those magnificent, huge operas and characters under a little microcosm each week and, and share that with the audience online. Well, absolutely. And, and I mean, those are a lot of highs, but come on, this, what are the lows? What were those lows? <laughs> oh, yes, there were some lows. I mean, especially in the early days, although, you know, to be honest, um, as anyone who works in, in, you know, live TV knows, I'm sure that, you know, things can go wrong at a drop of a hat. And, um, you know, because of a small business and, and because of all the pandemic restrictions, uh, really it was myself and, and Guy doing everything. And so I was presenting, I was performing, he was doing the same. And then behind the scenes, we were sort of pressing buttons you know just off the view of the camera to make you know the thing go to the next scene to make sure we 
were recording, make sure we were streaming, was it going to all the platforms it was meant to be going to, and, and that was incredibly stressful. And sometimes, you know, that wouldn't work. You know, there are a few times, um, you know, we'd have a guest singer in and they, you know, do this absolutely beautiful performance and then you'd see a message from one and someone say, well, they looked wonderful, but there was no sound. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we were in the room, we're like, oh, we can hear them and it looks like it's recording, but something had gone wrong in the chain and it didn't go out. And and so then, you know, I learned all about post-production editing and luckily this is how we've developed this this archive of, sort of over 100 performances that we now have on the Rogue wow. Opera VIP Pass platform, which is the membership um, site we developed. Um, so we could go back and and, and sort of, you know, bring in the original recordings and fix those little snafus. So, you know, nothing's ever lost, I guess, when you're live streaming because there is always a backup recording. Um, but, yeah, that you know, that, that stress of trying to wear so many hats on camera, knowing that there's an audience out there. And then also for me, and I think for, for everybody, it was such a different way to perform. Um, you know, we've all suffered Zoom fatigue and, you know, being online fatigue and, you know, as a performer, when you're in the room with your audience and your colleagues, you have so much synergy that goes on, so much uh, unconscious and unconscious feedback that you get from that audience and, and to not have that, to just be performing to a camera um, and, and having to get sort of delayed feedback if, you know, if people messaged you or sent you an email is, you know, it was a very challenging thing and it sort of, Sometimes it was good because it helps you, I guess, really absorb yourself in the performance because you don't have any external feedback. But when you're not used to doing that, it, that was often the, the times that, you know, there were the lows where you just think, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't have that, you know, energy to keep me going through throughout it all. So I think a little bit of burnout did happen every now and then. Um, and then the pressure also, you know, I, I sort of just set off at the beginning in, on Easter 2020 going, right, we're going to live stream every Friday. And then we did that for three months. Right now we're going to set up a membership platform. We're going to make it bigger and we're going to bring in other guest singers and we're going to have duets and, and that kind of thing. And I kept just creating this bigger and bigger vision. And then when I ended up pausing it in May this year, because luckily we're starting to get some live work back, um, you know, looking back at it, I thought, well, that's something I've never done in, in my career, either as a performer with Rogue Opera or even when I was training, um, or even in my, my business career as a marketing manager, producing new content every single week um, with, you know, essentially myself and, and Guy doing it as a team. Um, you know, it was a little bit crazy. And again, if I'd stopped to think about it, I probably wouldn't have, <laughs> wouldn't have done it. But, you know, on a positive, uh, we did do it. We've got some amazing content. I've learned so many new skills. I was able to give paid work to over 50 um, singers that I work with um, and all of the people who came to the Rogue Opera studio to perform or who created uh, virtual videos and, and we included those on the show. You know, absolutely everybody was just so grateful for some opportunity to perform even in this very unusual way so I'm really proud mm. of, of that achievement as well well you know the the you know the the, the theater and and music and and opera really really did come off badly um mm. over, over lockdown and with no financial support so um and it's incredible that you were able to achieve that um, I mean I'm, I'm really interested in the way that you built your membership platform because mm. what you're saying is that you 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 got your skills you figured out what worked what didn't work technically mm -hmm. uh, what worked creatively and then you kind of built on that by getting an audience mm. um, so I seem to remember um, meeting up with you um, you know across a across a table outdoors it's a distant uh, table outdoors that's right yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. and uh, you were like I've just built a website mm. um, so, <laughs> so tell me about this platform and mm. and kind of how you did it really yeah. how you did it and how it works yeah so I think you know after doing the initial three months where you know we were doing it for free we were asking people each week as part of the, the live stream it was usually a sort of a half an hour 45 minute show with performances and, and you know introductions and discussions as I said um, and then because you know there was no support and, and we were just doing this um, you know I started by setting up a, a fundraising campaign to just try and 
you know, ask anyone if they had anything they could donate, then that would help me pay the rogue operators who I was involving in the project. And, you know, it was amazing. People were so generous with that at a time where it was incredibly uncertain for so many people. Uh, so, you know, I was very, very grateful to that. Um, and then, you know, after a while that tailed off a little bit because, you know, we've been doing it for three months. And then also, you know, I sort of, because we were at that point, what would that have been, April, May, June, sort of in June 2020, it still really wasn't clear what was going to happen over winter. Uh, and I thought, well, I need to make a decision. Am I going to say, well, we did this for three months. We managed to do a little bit of, of things. We got some money to be able to pay some, some artists. That's great. Or if this is going to go on for much longer and our normal work isn't going to come back until next year, then, you know, should I take this more seriously and should I make it something that we could grow and that's what I decided to do. Uh, so because I decided it needed to be more serious, it needed to come off Facebook, it needed to go behind a paywall uh, because by that point, you know, lots of amazing people were doing what I was doing, which was live streaming on Facebook, sharing their, their music, their drama, their, you know, tips, etc. And I think that was a fantastic outlet for people. But I was also really um, concerned, actually, that musicians in particular were seeing this as the only way for them to be heard um, and to ask for donations. And it's always been a um, passion, another passion of mine that, you know, people uh, in this kind of age of on demand and Netflix and, and, you know, you can pay nine pounds a month and just have this huge amount of content on demand. That works for a massive organisation like Netflix who, you know, are able to then fund and pay, you know, amazing artists, you know, good money for the content they produce but that what that does mean is it trickles down to individuals and smaller companies where people some people have a tendency to expect fantastic things for free and i thought you know i just don't want to be part of that i've served a purpose for a while um but i thought now we need to move behind a membership platform and if we're going to move behind a paywall then it needs to be something really structured um so i think that's when i met up with you and i said right i'm going to build this this website and you know did some research and found a, a platform called member press which operates on wordpress um but has lots of really great sophisticated ways which you can sort of uh, channel your content and ask people to contribute different amounts of money for different levels of access um, and you know that so yeah that was a another project where I thought yeah that's fine I can just set up a membership platform in a short amount of time and I think we did that in six weeks so we had a six-week break and then we were live streaming again um, sort of from the end of August uh, with the VIP pass platform and so you know again really grateful that I learned all that I've learned you know how membership platforms work uh, but the next challenge of course was to get an audience because when we were going live or every week on Facebook we were getting you know several hundred views and then people would go back and watch it uh, and then as soon as you put up a paywall you then have to really encourage people to to try that out uh, so you know we were seeing steady growth um, you know everyone who has been in membership people in BNI said you know the growth that we had was was very good for a startup uh, and I think at our peak we got to about a hundred members um, which you know is is really fantastic um, and then I was at that that level of product product growth where uh, in May this year things were starting to open up uh, we saw actually it was going to take a lot more time investment in marketing time and money investment in marketing to keep growing that membership um, and as live events were starting to come back I had to make a decision you know, what can I focus on? There's only me really in the head of the company. As I said, I have great um, people around me who I can work on a project by project basis. Um, so we decided to pause the uh, membership subscription for the moment. Um, and it will be a sort of a matter for 2022 to see where we continue to, to grow that and what we do with that. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, you know, that is the looking ahead. So, mm. you know, you've had this tremendous growth, this you know, you have brought audiences to uh, audiences. You have brought opera to new mm. audiences mm. and into unusual places. Um, so, looking ahead, um, you know, we're unlocking, we're locking. Um, it is quite uncertain. But mm. where do you think online fits in with your your business plans and and where you're going for 2022? 
Yeah, so luckily the sort of last few months of, of this year, um, we've seen a, a resurgence in doing in-person events. Um, you mentioned the the show for Fullers, which was fantastic, and that was such a joy. That was the first sort of big live performance that we did after the lockdown. We had a few other galas, which, you know, were just so emotional to be out performing in the real world, world to a real audience. Um, and then, you know, thanks to the support of Fullers, really getting behind bringing art to audiences in their own location, um, you know, people can go to their local pub and see opera in the garden it's just such an incredible investment in arts and culture by fullers mm -hmm. uh you know that that's really kind of kick-started i think for me refocusing on that kind of live event and touring uh so we're going to be doing more things with them next year um we're doing some sort of galas with uh, the brasserie blanc chain restaurant chain doing a night at the opera and you know it's really made me just um appreciate even more why I'm in this business, why I'm a singer, why I'm a performer, why I'm a director, uh, because that frisson you get with a live audience is really unbeatable. And I didn't, I, I personally didn't find that through the online. Um, and then I say that to people who are members of the VIP Pass platform, and they said, no, we absolutely got that feeling from you through the screen. So um, I think it's something I need to reflect a little bit more on and, and appreciate how much it did give to the audience and you know there are great questions around accessibility to opera which is you know you know i'm very passionate about that if yeah. you can you know make this this internet this uh, video platform which is pretty much accessible to well certainly the most accessible platform in the world it's not accessible to absolutely everyone yet but it is accessible mm -hmm. to a huge wide audience and you have so much um, advantage with technology where you can have automatic caption translations so you know you, I could potentially be reaching an audience um, in you know in China or in uh, Russia you know with with the sort of the language barrier being removed so mm -hmm. I think the potential for that communication that potential to bring opera to someone in their own home in a, in a kind of um, very organic way, which is what the point of the platform is, because there are, of mm -hmm. course, wonderful, um, you know, productions. There's a, there's a, the Royal Opera House do um, streams of their stage productions. So, you know, people can have access to opera in that sense. But I think what I could still bring people is this kind of organic um, get behind the scenes, hear from the artists themselves, why they love this particular moment in this, piece of music uh, and I think that's a communication that uh, video and live streaming and, and online um, has made possible so I think there will be a place for it in the Rogue Opera business plan at some point uh, but I think I need to get the kind of revival <laughs> of uh, 2022 fingers crossed underway first um, to really sit back and reflect and think you know how can I how can I take this further um, but having said that I've had a number of um, um, inquiries is the word I'm thinking of uh, for people saying oh actually we're going to do a Christmas party this year we don't think we can do it in person can you offer something virtually and I said yes of course this is what I could offer I could do a you know half an hour live performance for you with one or two singers and a pianist and it's very um, good I was <laughs> <laughs> thank you Yola yeah so so now when really someone asks it. me that when someone asks me that then I can say yes absolutely I can do it and and I can you know my studio is is ready to go really at a moment's notice and, and because I've invested in the technology I've bought some really good quality microphones I've understand, understand what software I need to use to be able to um, give people a really high quality experience online um, you know that is that's I guess that is a product that I can offer and um, you know I don't want to jinx anything but if things go back uh, backwards then you know I'll be ready to kind of refocus on that again but um, as far as the VIP Pass platform and sort of the creating content every week, um, I think that's going to be something that's a longer term plan to re re resurrect. Now, what I do want to say at this point is that you are fundraising. And um, here's a caption. Fundraising concert in support of Royal Trinity Hospice this Thursday, the 2nd of December, 6.30 to 9 p.m., in Balham at mm -hmm. St. Mary and St. John the Divine. And that is the website, uh, rogueopera.co.uk forward slash carols. Um, I'm going to put it into the comments so you'll be able to pick it up and come along. Come along because um, raising money, not just for Rogue Opera, but also more importantly for an amazing charity, the Royal Trinity Hospice in mm. Clapham. 
Yes, um, yeah, so that's you ready? Really, Are you ready yeah, for it? I'm ready, yes, I'm ready, yeah. We had a rehearsal on Sunday, uh, so that's going to be myself and three other of my wonderful singers and, of course, Guy, as always, on, on the piano. Um, so we're going to bring lots of Christmas carols and performance pieces, but with, I guess, an operatic twist to it. So, um, you know, you'll get sort of what you might normally expect to be a, a sort of a whole choir of carol singers. There'll be the four of us uh, giving it our opera voices to, to bring, wow. you know, bring some joy to that audience and, and you know, there'll be lots of audience sing-along carols as well so that people can uh, raise their voices as we raise money for Trinity Hospice. So I'm really excited to be doing that event. And I hear there's a twist of some amazing cakes. There Thank are you. some amazing cakes. So I'm putting this <laughs> on with uh, Willow Bow Catering, uh, who are based in Wimbledon. So Claire from Willow Bow is, is cooking some wonderful Christmas treats and gingerbreads and mince pies. Um, we've got some, you know, there'll be a, a, a bar that people can donate to. And we're also really excited to have a new company or person that I've met recently uh, through the BNI network, um, David from Super Life Infusions. And he has these amazing herbal teas, uh, which are very good for you. But he He's designed a whole Christmas range, so I think you can have a, a mulled wine tea and an eggnog tea uh, and, you know, sort of get in the Christmas spirit but feel very virtuous because you're doing your body good at the same time. All the things we've really missed, definitely. Mm. Wonderful. Oh, gosh, it's going to be a really fantastic night. Yeah, I've, I'm definitely coming to that one. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so just to – I'd really like to just wrap up by picking your brain. Mm -hmm. So – are, have you got two really good tips for any of our viewers in the same industry as you or just mm -hmm. thinking about doing the kind of things and inspired by what you've done? Mm. Let me think. Um, on the spot. Think, <laughs> on the spot, yes. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, partly because we're living in such unusual times and I guess this does apply really any time, but particularly now, you know, things still are uncertain. And so just be brave, you know, take a risk, try something new, challenge yourself. Um, you know, you, you normally would never launch a whole new product and a whole new way of presenting things live. Um, but that was the only choice I had and I did it and it's worked out great in a way. Um, yeah. It had its, you know, pains along the way, but it, mean, it means that I can now really confidently, as I said, if, if a client comes to me and says, you know, I've got this event and we want to try and get all these people together, but we can't be in the same room, can you help? And, I've, and I can do it absolutely. And I can do that with confidence. And I know, you know, they'll have an amazing experience, um, you know, via Zoom or, or whatever. And I guess the other tip is kind of related to that, that um, it is worth investing in good equipment. And that's not something that's accessible to everybody. So if you, you know, you don't have the resources to invest in good equipment, then maybe look out for um, any kind of funding or charities or, you know, sort of equipment sharing. I think that would be a great thing if, if sort of people in the artist community would share uh, this, not only the knowledge they've had, but, you know, sort of tips on equipment. Um, but it is, it is important, particularly, I think, for music, if you're going to be presenting in this medium, Mm -hmm. uh, you do need to have a certain quality of image and sound and yeah. you need to have you need to be confident in your streaming platform so you know there are lots of them out there and it does again that takes a bit of investment in your time as well just to really mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. it yourself and if you're lucky enough to have someone technical that can do that for you that's great but if we're talking about sort of what I did you know being an individual um, or small business where you're having to do that a lot of that now because we're we're in this uncertain time then don't be afraid but do do your research and wherever you can invest in some good equipment don't just buy the first lavier mic that pops up on amazon when you're searching for lavier mics which is what i did the first time mm. around um and it was a disaster so i wasted 40 pounds on that <laughs> uh, I, uh, well I, I do sympathize because um i was really i was really lucky i i phoned a friend and um they sent me a list mm. you know buy this buy this buy the other and you're absolutely right you know if you mm. talk to somebody who has been through it but saying that there's some great stuff on on youtube you know oh, absolutely mm -hmm. i learned everything i mm. i didn't realize you could learn to do things on mm -hmm. youtube yeah um you know i'm podcasting now yeah. and I, yeah i had to kind of figure it out how to do it i came up mm. with this idea of doing it on zoom i thought then i googled that and youtube that and saw how to do that and then mm. but it does take time and it does, um yeah. 
it's it's really worth it mm. so and actually my third tip which is connected oh. to that Yola, is um actually look at the gamers all these uh young kids who've been streaming online for years know the yeah. equipment and actually the youtube videos i watched and the equipment sort of advice i ended up getting from youtube were these these you know mainly young men <laughs> who sat in yeah. their bedrooms and they would stream them playing video games so they needed high bandwidth they needed good quality quality audio and video and they needed yeah. all the things that they you know the gadgets that sort of make this easier so yeah i, I got a lot of tips from the gaming industry funnily enough wow wow well thank you so much from all thank you and i'm just going to put up your concert again so Lovely. thank you so much thanks for coming on our very first show um so there you go if i can stream you can stream too um and certainly you know bronwyn's taken it to the next level um thank you so much and thank you everyone for for watching today and um i have got a, a bit of a treat i've got end titles end credits to go out on <laughs> so, thanks for having me Ella. thank you so much bronwyn thank you Thank you.